Hi, my name is Ron Rogers, and this video is titled Flight Test Tales. Help, we need a chase. Now, from 77 to 79, I was assigned out at Edwards uh, in the command post. Uh, I had worked with Colonel Sanders uh, getting a by name request to come out there and be officer in charge of the command post. And there were a lot of fun things going on at the time. And uh, I was a first lieutenant. Now, it was kind of interesting. Um, I Okay, this is back in when I was in my uh, 20s, mid-20s, and I had absolutely no concept of failure or danger or whatever I would say. I did just clueless. <laughs> clueless is probably the correct term because the two previous guys who had had this job before me were both fired for screwing up. And this was a very high-level job. What you did was you kept the operation running on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. You uh, worked to coordinate the uh, scheduled test aircraft, the chase aircraft, any support that was necessary. Uh, you coordinated this act activity through the range complex, the R-2508 complex, and depending on what was going on, you coordinated with other activities. It was a really fun job it was a it was a it was an adrenaline type job it was really cool because uh, stuff could happen very rapidly and one of the main things that occurred was okay you're doing a test program now this isn't like you know when i flew for the airlines like you know if you had a couple of minute delay for a maintenance problem that was a big deal on on test programs okay everything's new things tend to slip and okay what happens well the, uh, the B-1 is supposed to take off at 10 o'clock in the morning with appropriate range support, chase support, and it's it's going to slip to 11. So they call me up and say, hey, we're slipping. We need to slip everything. So I would take and coordinate. I'd try to shuffle things around. You know, they would be slipping uh, range time and chase time into like the uh, um, F-16 mission. So I would try to see, hey, can I swap you guys out? Can you go now? Can I move you up? I'm moving them back, do the chase support. So it was kind of a juggling act. And um, you got to know um, a lot of high up people. I, I At my desk there, um, I had, uh, and this is kind of old technology, but I had, a, I had a phone handset and I had this board that had little buttons that um, you punched them and you went directly to uh, whatever program, the B1, the F-16, and, and they, uh, it was, it was a, a little phone with a line from headquarters, and they answered right away because they knew it was something important, and usually when they called you, uh, you knew that they were requesting something important. Now, um, I'm going to tell you, uh, digress here slightly. Um, at the time, I worked for a uh, full bird colonel, Colonel uh, Ted Twenting. Now, he was a very interesting guy. Now, Colonel Sanders had been the one that kind of hired me, but he was um, uh, retiring at the time, and uh, Colonel Twinning came in. Uh, he came in in August of 77, and that's the same month I came in. So we were both kind of brand new together, but he was, he was a very interesting guy, very uh, straightforward, uh, fun guy, no nonsense uh, to work for. Um, he had been a test pilot. He was involved in flight testing of the A7, the A37, the F4, and the 105F model. Now, he had been, he had flown 100 uh, combat missions in the F105. Now, I knew a lot of uh, fighter pilots, but uh, I knew I knew quite a few uh, 105 pilots, and they were before my time, but uh, I'll tell you right flat out, I think some of the coolest fighter pilots around were the F-105 guys. These guys, these guys were bar none cool fighter pilots, and uh, I really enjoyed being uh, associated with them. Um, actually, at the time uh, that I worked for him, I didn't know he had been a 105 uh, uh, combat pilot. But, okay, he comes in as the commander of the 65 uh, 10th Test Wing. Uh, he later... Uh, made major general and came back and uh, you know was in command of the in entire base and and that part dovetails into the story at a later date. Now one of the major programs out there was the B1. It was a big program until Carter canceled it, but of course it came back. The A was redesigned, came back as the B a little bit later. But there was a a lot of testing that was going on at the time. Now oh the funny thing when I worked in current ops. Um, 
if, if things started to go bad, uh, the wing commander, uh, Colonel Twinning, would come down. He'd stand, uh, stand in the back of the room. Uh, it was kind of interesting. He uh, virtually never said anything. Um, the, uh, the general usually didn't, didn't come down unless it was something really bad going around. But uh, uh, Colonel Twinning would often uh, come in there. And uh, one of the programs, uh, of course, a big high-priority program was the B-1. Now, the B-1 uh, needed chase support, and they had four F-111s. Two is about all they could keep operational at the time, and uh, it, was, uh, it was the aircraft you needed, but they weren't always operational, so they fell back on the T-38. And I flew the T-38, um, and I flew several missions on the, uh, in, in support of the B-1, but the T-38 did not have the legs. Uh, the B-1 would run you out of gas. We had to use a series of T-38s that would come up and trade off to keep a, a test mission going. Now, at the time, the highest profile mission was the F-16. And uh, I hate to say it, but sometimes if you're number one on the list and the, the various test programs are ranked one, two, three, four, if you were number one on the list and you slipped, you wiped out the number two guy on the list. And if you were number two, like the A-10, the F-15 or the B-1, uh, you, you know, I had to reshuffle that. You kind of, uh, you know, it was kind of uh, tough, uh, whatever. <laughs> Got to keep the channel clean here. But anyway. Uh, you know, there'd be maintenance delays, the airplane wasn't quite ready, you'd slip. But sometimes these people uh, would use this uh, capacity egregiously. And I one time was slipping all day, uh, the F-16 program, and I later find out, and it, it really kind of galled me, that um, they were we, we were holding uh, and slipping and shuffling people around the ranges and the in the, the test aircraft, the chase aircraft, for an aircraft that did not even have its engine installed. And I thought, okay, that really kind of ticked me off. Um, there came a point when the F-16 lost its number one position uh, on the test program, and I forget exactly who replaced it, to tell you the truth at this point, but they lost their number one position. Of course, um, you know, they knew it, but uh, they were slipping and they called me up and they wanted to, you know, to slip, to let me know that they were slipping. That was okay. And I, and I said, uh, uh, sorry, can't do it. Okay, well, I almost immediately got a call back from the chief test pilot saying that, you know, we need the support. We're number one. I go, well, um, Colonel, uh, you, you may have, uh, I, I think you're aware that, no, you're not number one anymore. You're number two, and you have been replaced by a higher, uh, higher importance program. And I'm standing there trying not to chuckle, but I could just feel that there was probably a slow burn uh, going on the other side of the phone, but it never felt so good. Anyway, I digress. Okay, back to the B-1. Well, it was always a problem, mission slip, coordinating the chase, stuff like this. Um, but, you know, when it was a test program, it had a high degree of importance, and you slipped everything, and you tried to coordinate it, and that was just the way life was. Okay, well, all fun times uh, come to an end, and you've gone from being into a big important flight test program now into production. And uh, Rockwell uh, had their facilities down at Palmdale, and uh, anytime you produce a new airplane, you have to go through production flight tests, get all the bugs worked out before you can uh, send it off into the Air Force. So that's what they were doing. But uh, to do those production flight tests, they still needed a chase. So they were getting the F-111 chase out of Edwards. But of course, Production flight test is a whole different animal than experimental flight test, and there was getting to be a problem where they were just uh, slipping and slipping and slipping, and the crews were standing around, and now the center commander, General Twinning, was not was not excited about this at all and, and did some complaining, and uh, they needed to start looking for another way to handle this. Well, initially they found, uh, out in the West Coast, they found some civilian T-38s, but, uh, and, and they were just beautiful airplanes that had been restored. Well, okay, uh, 
still the same problem that they had before with the T-38. It doesn't have the legs. And, and you would you would try to run a production flight test program, which could be a, you know, it, it, it took many hours and the T-38 just couldn't do it. So you ran into a lot of problems using that as support. And they thought, well, um, maybe we can come up with something else. And they actually floated an idea. They were uh, converting F-106s into drones, uh, QF-106s. And, uh, uh you know, these airplanes were going out of the inventory, converting into drones with a various inglorious ending of using them as targets, which is a, a very unfortunate for such a beautiful airplane, but that's what they're ending up. But it was kind of like, hey, maybe we can use these as chase aircraft. And it was kind of funny. Uh, one of the test pilots uh, proposed this and they actually said, yeah, that's a good idea. So what they did was they brought on some 106s as chase aircraft. Now, when I originally came across a picture of the B-1 being chased by a 106, I'm going, what the heck is this? this I, I don't remember any 106s being used. Um, they were uh, in, you know, being phased out at the time in the Air Force. And that, that caused a little bit of a problem because uh, there was no longer any formal school to check out in the 106. And so how do you do this if you don't have a formal school? Well, they were able to get some Air National Guard pilots who were... Uh, current and they were uh, guys who would act as uh, flight instructors and examiners and they would get the appropriate pilots uh, checked out to fly these as chase. So now Rockwell had their own chase aircraft, a group of 106s and that kind of uh, solved the problem. So it was very ingenious um, almost almost bordering on brilliant solution uh, to this problem of uh, because you know, it's uh, when I was at flight test uh, at Cessna, we used just other uh, Cessna aircraft to chase. Uh, that was pretty straightforward. But when you got an airplane as complex, big, and long legs as a B-1, and it has to go through a lot of complex checkout, you, you need a more sophisticated chase aircraft. And to come up with one that would actually work and solve the problem uh, was, was pretty darn brilliant, in my opinion. So the B-1... Uh, has been around for a very long time now. In fact, uh, okay, well, 70s is a long time ago, and I'm kind of uh, surprised at, you know, how far these things go. Of course, the B-52 has been around forever. But, um, you know, I, I've talked to pilots who have been on this airplane. You know, yeah, I spent 25 years flying the, uh, the, the B-1, the bone. And it's like, wow, yeah. But it had a, it had a fun start, a lot of activities, got involved in chasing it, and um, it's turned out to be an absolutely uh, exceptional aircraft in the Air Force inventory. So that's the story of uh, Help, We Need a Chase, and how some people were very ingenious in finding a very workable solution uh, to the problem. Hey, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it.